Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming today and uh, for listening to my talk. Uh, my name is Brian Rothenberg. I've uh, had the great pleasure of working on marketplace businesses for about 15 years uh, as a founder, as an operator, and as an executive, and also most recently as an angel investor. Uh, but most relevant to this talk today, uh, I'll be going through some of my experiences as VP of growth at Eventbrite over the last six years where I helped to scale the business from about 100 people and sort of the startup phase through to 1,200 people and our IPO this last fall. But one of the key transitions that we made as a business is shifting and evolving from a pure SaaS product into more of a two-sided network and a marketplace. Uh, so I'm excited to talk about that today. Uh, so many of you have probably read this post by Chris Dixon that he published in 2015 where he argued uh, there's a great strategy for creating network businesses in that you build a single player tool that works for one side of the, the network and it's a great way to start uh, the network being created. And in that post he talked about Instagram being a key example. So this is a classic example of building a single player tool. The initial hook for the product was largely a photo filter tool. They also enabled users to post to their social networks, so via Facebook and Twitter, which helped to drive distribution in these strong viral dynamics where new people who had not started out as users of the tool saw these posts with these great filters and then thought, oh, I'd really like to use that, and they'd become Instagram users as well. So this drove the creators of the si supply side back to the network uh, to help fuel that network. And over time, Usage on Instagram itself became the primary network that people were using the tool, and eventually they built out their own social network, and you all know how that ended. But more broadly, this approach is often effective in using software to target, service, and aggregate a new or fragmented user base when starting a network. And often with SaaS to Marketplace, uh, it's a tool focused on building and aggregating the supply side of the market. So as the SaaS tool starts to roll up and create density of supply, over time there can be a shift towards connecting with more demand, which helps create those two-sided network effects. And this approach has been leveraged by a number of highly valuable companies and growing startups in the space. Here are just a few examples. But using the example that I know best, Eventbrite, in 2011, it was really a self-serve SaaS product, and this, this headline sort of summarizes it. It was a ticket sales software tool targeted to small and medium-sized events. So back then, it worked largely like this. We would work to acquire supply. That supply was in event creators who would bring their inventory of events to the platform and use the software to sell tickets and manage their events. They would then market their own events to their own demand and create those transactions in between. Eventbrite didn't have to drive demand on behalf of those creators. But we believed back then that Eventbrite could eventually thrive as a marketplace. So really layering that demand side later such that event creators would not only market their events and drive their own sales, but Eventbrite would drive incremental sales as well. So this, this title slide is actually from a presentation I gave to Kevin Hartz, our CEO and founder, as well, of one, as well as one of our board members in December of 2012 in my final interview. And I laid out my thesis for how Eventbrite could build a marketplace business uh, and why it was so instrumental to the, the company's long-term growth. And so this is kind of a, a text-heavy summary slide, but the key takeaway is my impressions and my intuition back then largely held true. And even some of the points became key strengths listed in our IPO prospectus when we filed last year. So since then, Eventbrite has developed growing marketplace dynamics, but it definitely didn't happen overnight. It was a very, very difficult transition to get there. And so I think, well, my intuition was right. I underestimated how hard it would be. So what I hope to do today is go through some of the learnings through those six years uh, that you may be able to apply to your companies or companies that you're looking to invest in. I really think it starts with a step zero, which is asking, is there really a need? Is there enough demand that wants to connect with your supply? So this business model of taking SaaS companies and involving them into two-sided networks, it's not right for every business. There, there may not be enough demand looking for your supply. So one thing we did at Eventbrite was we worked to validate um, or disprove that there is this demand. And a few ways that we did so, we worked to quantify 
uh, search demand and also activity on other social networks to see how active are people in seeking out events and, and things to do. We also did deep user research. So we looked for who are the key personas that have this need? Is it a real pain point? How do they describe that pain point and how can we meet it? And then we actually staffed up a very small team. It was four people to start who uh, built prototypes and actually tested these with users to see, can we create a solution that helps to solve their need? And we did all of that before creating a huge investment for the business. You also need the right products on the shelves, so the right supply where people are looking. So I believe that you should take a narrow, vertical, and ultra-local approach as opposed to creating a horizontal and broad approach. This picture here is of a memo that was written in 2001 uh, by a friend of mine who was an executive at OpenTable. OpenTable used to sell their software and hardware into any restaurant throughout the United States. What this memo suggested is we need to focus on four key cities only, not sell in anywhere else, and have that be the approach we take to build supply density such that we can create a two-sided network and, and, and marketplace dynamics. So a long time ago, but pretty innovative at the time, and uh, we took a similar approach at Eventbrite. Also, given that you need to fund two businesses in parallel, so your SaaS business and your marketplace business that are often distinct and different, you need to be hyper-efficient in growing your supply and your demand. And I'll share a few ideas. The first of which is, I believe that a self-serve software approach as opposed to a sales-driven go-to-market is a critical pillar of SaaS to marketplace businesses. Uh, taking another stat from Eventbrite's S1, uh, we, we did disclose that about 95% of our event creators, our supply, sign themselves up on the platform versus being onboarded through sales and account management. And that leads to highly efficient uh, cost of acquisition. This is a post written by a friend of mine, Gokul Rajaram, an advisor to my prior startup, uh, who posits that truly great software companies are self-serve first. And some of the reasons that he says this are how self-service can accelerate trial. If there's no gatekeeper in front of using your product, you'll get people using it in new ways that you didn't expect. You can often help to create new markets as opposed to capturing share from existing competitors. Uh, self-serve is a great way to open up the top of funnel. So it can turn a SaaS business into uh, much more of a, a, a consumer-oriented customer acquisition uh, approach as opposed to sales only. And then, of course, there's a cost advantage generally with self-serve versus full sales go to market. I also like this quote by Jeff Bezos when he talks about the self-serve nature of Amazon's platforms. He says, when a platform is self-service, even the improbable ideas can get tried because there's no gatekeeper to get in the way. So just to summarize, self-serve really helps to fill out the long tail of your supply, and it can enable sparks of net new usage. And to share one of those examples, Eventbrite was initially built self-service, but also primarily, actually exclusively for paid events. It was never intended to have a free product. But people started actually using it, putting zero dollars in the price field and using it for free events. Now, a lot of people could have viewed that as a, as a workaround and closed that, loop, that gap. But the Eventbrite team leaned into that and said, we should foster this usage. And over time, it led to Eventbrite's highly powerful freemium loop, whereby people come onto the platform using the, the service for free and then ultimately convert into paid users. And in Eventbrite's S1, we disclosed about 17% of our paid creators start out as free. So highly efficient customer acquisition. So while free is good, getting paid is obviously better in that it helps to bootstrap the marketplace, right? If you can charge your supply side for your service while you're working to build on the demand side, it's really a funding mechanism also to help get the marketplace going. And then as you build marketplace liquidity later, you can charge for those incremental transactions that you're driving in addition to charging for the core software that you provide. Another common misconception that I've seen is that initiatives benefit either supply or your demand efforts. But what I've found is that there's often overlap in between. And to bring one example to life, um, our SEO efforts um, that are more consumer oriented, right? People searching for things to do in San Francisco. We actually found that about 20% of our event creators are our supply side that we acquire through SEO come in through these consumer pages, which kind of makes sense if you think about it. People who are looking to market their events are also seeing who's showing up in all these consumer destination channels, and they want to be where you have distribution. 
Another example of the overlap in, of supply and demand, this is an interview from 2009 with Roloff Botha, who led Sequo uh, Eventbrite Series A from Sequoia and Eventbrite's founders. And he talked about how during diligence calls, uh, when he asked, how did you learn about Eventbrite? Many of the customers referenced, oh, I bought a ticket on the platform first, I learned about it, and then I later became an event creator. This also became a hugely powerful viral dynamic for the business in that some people who start out buying a ticket ultimately convert into the supply side. We found ways to dial that up over time. We actually tripled that rate of conversion through a lot of experimentation and positioning. And in Eventbrite's S1, we disclosed about 34% of our supply side first become aware of the platform by buying a ticket. So again, you knew, I highly suggest you look for those areas that have overlap between supply and demand such that you're benefiting both sides of the marketplace while you're scaling. And as you aggregate this valuable supply, ideally it's net new supply that's unique and differentiated, uh, we found that others will want it. So in this example, Eventbrite not only drives traffic to its own uh, apps and its own platform, uh, but also through services like Facebook, Instagram, Google, et cetera, where we've done partnerships. So these platforms want to distribute our content, and in turn, that drives distribution, and not only actual sales, but also the perception of Eventbrite's helping us sell more tickets, which creates those cross-side network effects that we all want. Um, also, I found that showing network acti activity, even if it's a little bit of fake it till you make it, uh, can be highly effective. So liquidity and network effects don't kick in overnight. They take a long time and they're very gradual. So along the way, I found it's beneficial to show signs of marketplace activity. So ultimately, while well, you want to say, hey, we're driving X percent more transactions for you than you have otherwise would have, or we're driving all of your transactions, if you can start to drip that activity saying, here's how many times your listings were viewed this week, here's how many people are searching in your area, giving signs of life of the marketplace until you can get to that end goal can be highly effective because people generally want to believe that, that it's happening. You just need to help to reinforce that message. Okay, so if you decide we're ready to make the shift, we've got our SaaS business, things are humming, we want to jump to marketplace, little heads up. Your supply base is likely to get pretty upset when you start marketing to their customers. So one thing that we found, these are some paraphrased quotes of things we heard, but things like, take your logo off of my event listing page. Why the heck are you emailing my customers and marketing other events? Or you're putting other people's events on my page, right? It, it makes sense. They're used to driving traffic to these pages. But what we found is it's really important to listen, learn, but not to overreact to an angry and vocal minority. So these people will be loud, but they're a small subset of the overall user base. And it, it was our belief that the overall prize of building the network is worth much more than losing a few customers. So we all know you can't be everything to everyone. We did lose some customers over it, but the end benefit was great enough that it was worth it. So a couple tips and things that we learned, we did many of these things gradually over time. So Eventbrite's logo on our event pages used to be very small and very secondary to the branding of our customers. We increased that size gradually, incrementally over time, and people were less vocal about those changes. Also, communicating the value that you're driving. So, hey, yes, we are positioning this as a marketplace. Um, there are some downsides, but also we're driving incremental sales for you. You're getting benefit can be effective in mitigating some of that, that feedback. So if this were a representation of your exploratory marketplace efforts as the astronaut, the black hole is your core business. It just wants to keep sucking all of the resources and investment back into that core business. Inertia is really, really powerful. So evolving your company ethos and talent and building this marketplace muscle takes a lot of change. You need to inject new talent. Often the people who help to build the SaaS business that's your core business are not the right people to help you expand into your marketplace efforts. These marketplace investments require that just that, resources and investment. So it often requires trade-offs of not investing as much in the core SaaS business. And change is hard. People will be loud, they will be vocal, they will be unhappy. We debated several times whether we should stop the marketplace efforts and just stick to Eventbrite's core business of being a SaaS platform, but we ultimately persevered and kept going at it. 
And part of that was from a strong CEO directive. It really, really, re really requires top-down support from the CEO, from the board uh, to make that investment. And I'll add that org structure matters. So we kept trying to resource our marketplace efforts using people's shared time. So, you know, Brian, you spend 20% of your time on marketplace and 80% on the SaaS business. And it just wasn't working to really make material progress. So what we ultimately did is we broke the business up into different business units where there were fully staffed resources focused on the demand and marketplace business, while others were focused on supply and then platform resources underneath. And lastly, you know, it's been mentioned a couple times so far today, marketplaces require patience, they require persistence and grit and tenacity to get going. And we all know that. So it could take five to 10 years to get your SaaS business to the point of even having enough supply, enough inventory to be ready to make this jump. And then as you get going on the marketplace efforts, you're looking at another five to 10 years to get those going. So just know it'll take a long time. But with the right approach and with consistent effort applied over time, it can be done. And if you believe this is right for your business, go and stick with it. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, uh, hi, Kenny Faye from Imparty. I'm uh, curious, did you have ticket sellers selling on multiple outlets and how did you know, did that impact your marketplace? Uh, we did initially have sellers selling on multiple platforms. Um, Exclusivity is unique to the United States market. In many international markets like Europe, people do distribute their tickets on any platform, and it's just how many more can you sell for us. Um, so we've tried to drive exclusive inventory where we can, but you don't always have that capability. So ultimately, if you're not in a primary exclusive relationship with your supply, you ultimately have to drive more demand to be competitive in the marketplace. Yeah, sure, yes. Yeah, so the question was, how do we leverage the supply side to drive more demand? Um, yes, we did a lot of things. It was explaining best practices for marketing to these, these supply side folks. So, you know, where should you post your event besides Eventbrite? Um, we did exclusive partnerships with companies like Facebook, whereby they could syndicate their events into Facebook and have native checkout where all the transactions would happen on Facebook as opposed to having to come back to Eventbrite, which drove greater conversion. So it, it was a number of things. It wasn't just one. We would even advise them on how to create their event page in the right way to rank well in SEO. So it's, it's, it was really about empowerment um, and taking the right steps to help them sell more tickets. Yes. That's a great question. So it was about how do you balance uh, owning the end user relationship versus the, the platform partnerships that I described. And um, I would say it's, it's touchy, <laughs> like it was a point of contention. I can't go into all the details, but really we felt like we needed to own the customer relationship such that we could service our customers in the right way, be able to look up their orders, et cetera. So uh, we made that key in any distribution deal that we did. Yes. Yeah. Um, so the question was, how do you get the demand side cold start? Um, how do you overcome the cold start problem on the demand side? I would say for us, we looked at where do we have a competitive advantage on the demand side and where can we make a few small bets and see what works? And uh, a key example was um, because Eventbrite had the most events of any ticketing platform on, in the world based on the free business and the long tail business, the way it worked is these event creators had their own websites. They would link to their Eventbrite pages, which drove tremendous inbound links, which gave us an advantage in SEO where we could rank better. And so that was a core thesis we had. And we put a small team focused on SEO to see if we can prove out, hey, we can really move the needle. And we did. And then we kept on staffing that up. So I'd say you have to look at like, what is your unique business advantage? Where do you think you can drive better distribution than anyone else? And how do you test your way into it and then double down as you get signal that it's working? Yes? Pricing adjust for this transition? Like, what, what did you guys look at and what were some of the main 
That was, a, that was a great question. So how did pricing evolve as we went through this transition? So Eventbrite had the same pricing. It was one size fits all. You pay to use the platform for all functionality for almost 10 years. And actually in 2017, we repriced the product into three tiers. So sort of your good, better, best software model. We actually decreased the cost to use the service for people who were not using full functionality and made it slightly more expensive for those that were getting a ton of value out of the platform. And the pricing strategy was such that we wanted to price low early on to grab market share. As we increased our pricing over time, we still kept a, a basic package relatively low cost to keep uh, you know, wide market share and have a free product create more inventory. Um, but over time where we're going or where the business is likely to go, I don't want to speak for them because I'm not there anymore, um, but it will likely turn into charging incrementally for transactions that Eventbrite drives and charging less likely for transactions that are driven by um, the event creators or the supply side themselves. Any other questions? Okay. Oh, one more. Yeah, so the question is, is retention for the self-serve segment different from the sales segment? Um, unfortunately, I can't comment on that because it's not broken out publicly. Cool. One more. Sorry, one more question. Yeah. Did your pricing change depending on who kind of sent the customer your way? Uh, great question. It, it doesn't today. Uh, but that's a likely evolution. Uh, many businesses go through that. So Open Table charges less if the transaction happens on the restaurant's website. They charge more if it comes through their network, which makes a lot of sense. Cool. Thank you again.